Press the bell icon on YouTube and don't miss another update. Last time I delivered a speech, some uh, Mr. Nariman sent me a small note. I preserved it. I assure you, Mr. Nariman, I shall preserve it for my memory, for posterity and history, which is some kind, sometimes kind and sometimes unkind. I do not judge people by history. I judge people by their activities and their perspectives. So many nice things have been told about me. In a farewell function, it's an acceptable norm that those whom one appreciates and spend time with them in any manner sour praise and admiration. That is courtesy. That is formality. But today, I'm compelled to believe, and I strongly believe with my unimpeachable faith, it's not mere out of courtesy or ceremonial appreciation, but genuine love expressed in meaningful words. And those words are false for me, and I shall cherish their shine forever. When so many people are standing, I treat it as standing love. People who are sitting, I treat it as sitting love. So love sitting and love standing, all love for me, I treat it as a genuine gesture. What do you mean by genuine gesture? Is there any definition? Is there any color to it? Yes. The definition is, it has just struck me just now. When you are moved by some kind of spontaneous emotion by which you do not feel a pain on your legs or boredom or ennui, I'm assuming that you are not feeling the pain on your pains and not feeling bored. It's a presumption which you allow me today. Presumption allowed, I call it a genuine love. As you have been sanguine and spoken from the core of your heart, I feel obliged to respond in the same tenor. I know it. It's quite difficult. But when one doesn't act with a clear conscience, a task of great difficulty becomes easy. And I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, I am also responding from the heart. I told you in the morning, I am responding from the heart, and in the evening I shall respond to you in the mind. But later on I thought, let me speak from the heart. I have strongly believed that a child, when leaves the direct parental core and goes to school and thereafter gets into the field of higher education, the society in a different way becomes the second mother. It embraces him or her on the lap. From the mother to the society. From the original mother to the society mother. And if you don't treat the society as a mother, you are nowhere. But why do you say about society mother to say young generation, old generation? Do you need mothers? Don't answer. You need mothers. You know why? Not because I say so. I'll read. When a person joins the bar, the great institution, the bar with its collective sensitivity, I use the words with conviction, the collective sensitivity fosters and nurtures him by expressing dearest proximity. It is called noble acceptance. When a member of a bar is invited to the judge, bar celebrates and tells him that it would guide him all the time. I may put it slightly differently. The bar, with collective wisdom, vibrant spirit, and excited intellectual enthusiasm, mothers your feelings assist to grow 
intellectually and helps you to expand your horizon. With the changing climate, not the sun is setting and the evening is melting, it's a different climate. The climate present over here, all of you are the particles of climate. With the changing climate, it becomes a breeze between the ivory towerism, a breeze between the ivory towerism and the reality in a real sense. And I mean it, you bring us the pathway you carve, the bridge you build, and we travel to the reality. We throw away the alien sentence that mankind cannot bear <coughs> too much of reality. That's a philosophical statement. When the bar connects a judge with the ground reality, it's a strong bridge. It's not comparable to London Bridge where a poet would say, London Bridge is falling down. London Bridge doesn't fall down. I mean the bar. When I say so, it is not to be understood that the judges are not aware of reality. But I am talking of the needed breeze to connect. It connects us to belong and it matters. All are done in good and healthy spirit. I may unhesitatingly add that on occasions the young members, I am addressing the young now, the young members enlighten our vision and imbibe the progressive ideas in one, but express with humility by using the word assistance. I am of the view that while the experience of the bar deserves respect, the ability of the young has to be appreciated. I appreciate the responsive wisdom, the collective wisdom of the youth, of the young generation, of which I am a part. I have not grown old and I don't intend to wear my trousers fold. I am the view, today young lawyers are assets and they have the potentiality to develop jurisprudence in new areas of legislation, a new jurisprudence in the earlier understanding of law, because as has been told to you, the law is not static, jurisprudence cannot be static. And that is why I consider it's my fervent duty to admit without any innovation that I respect the senior members of the bar and fondly respond to the junior members, my dearest friends. I must tell you that justice must have a human face and human approach. There are artificial divisions or barriers of caste, creed, religion and gender that may attempt to divide us, but the golden thread of humanity that binds us to each other and that alone constitutes the spirit and ethos of justice. Justice must be insulated with disruptive factors. Justice here, the scales of justice has to be balanced as far as possible, that is the true essence of justice. It cannot tilt in other, either side owing to anyone's aggressive views. The lady of justice is blindfolded to signify neutrality since each case, whether involving a greater or smaller ramification, is the same for us. The tears of a poor man is equal to the tears of a rich man. Tears are tears. And to me, tears are false. I have to collect them with equity, justice, and my constitutional perception. Popular perceptions or capacity to have build narratives or any particular leaning can never, and I mean never, guide the course of justice. That is how the neutrality, ethicality, 
and the purity of the stream of justice is maintained. That is how the independence of the judiciary is maintained. I echo the feelings of my learned brother, Justice Gogai, the Chief Justice designate, that the independence of judiciary stands erect and that shall stand erect and there is the collegiality amongst the brothers and sister judges of the court and the Supreme Court stands supreme, not today, in times ever to come. Any kind of craftsmanship cannot steal away the judicial independence. But I must simultaneously add, we require to have courage, character, grit and integrity to face whatever it takes to interpret the law correctly and deliver justice. Truth has no color. It is always not as it seems to be or it is made to appear. To borrow a place from William Blake, different context. Somebody asked me in the afternoon, said, do you like William Blake? I said, and the description was given, he's a romantic poet. I said, no, he's not a romantic poet. He's a mystical poet in a different way. Let's not discuss Blake. I told them, not you. I'm quoting a phrase for appreciation from the Blakeian appreciation. If the, I quote, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, unquote. Follow Blake, not the mystical Blake, but the prosaic Blake over here. Lawyers, I have no reservation to confess how an immense and responsible role to play. Some cases may be won, some may be lost depending on the merits of the case and the interpretation of law. And that is why one is reminded of Socrates, the carpenter, philosopher, who had said, I quote a line, when the debate is lost, Slander becomes the tool of the loser, unquote. If I prepared, I can narrate an incident with what happened to Socrates once. But nobody should misunderstand. Socrates loved long back. He was teaching a group of people. He was a carpenter. He was not getting money. Mr. Socrates came. He said, you are only talking nonsense. I don't have food. How long I can serve you bread only? Have bread. Socrates did not say anything. His disciple, including Plato, was there. Almost, I think, that the history records, 2025, 20, were around. Socrates remained unmoved. But Mrs. Socrates was a very, very difficult lady. That's what Plato describes. She came with a bucket full of water and poured on Socrates. The disciples were stunned. He said, why are you stunned? Why are you astonished? Why are you perplexed? I knew it. Because when the thunder was there, I knew the rain is not far behind. I knew it is coming. He said, it's a digression. It's a digression. I think all of you love little digressions sometimes. What Socrates said with regard to the legal debate, legal discussion, it has to be taken in a healthy spirit and any kind of annoyance or a different feeling has to be avoided. Lawyers must not turn out to be so loser by imputing motives into everything. They can dissociate themselves from such tendencies only if they abandon their fixated notion. The Indian judiciary is one of the most robust institutions in the world and that is because of its judges who always believe in upholding the law and thereby maintaining the legitimacy of the judicial system or the legal system. Time and again the rights of the people have been preserved and cemented with a dynamic vision by refusing 
to choke or freeze the moving stream of law and justice with a stagnant or rigid interpretation. Our judiciary, now I have changed the word from Indian judiciary to our judiciary. I intend to attach a sense of belonging. Unless you belong, you are nowhere. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a play by Eugene O'Neill, the American Nobel Laureate, who has written a play on the sense of belonging, and that is why I am using the phraseology of our judiciary. It has been the strongest institution standing firm and resolute on the face, the face of attacks, assaults, and even in troubled times. Our judges are far ahead of their counterparts in other countries, shining with ability to resolve mind-boggling number of cases. What you keep doing in just a drop in the vast ocean, but the ocean would be definitely be less without that drop. Never count drops. Remember, droplets make drops, drops make wavelets, and eventually wavelets make ocean. And all of us are contribute to that droplets or drops or the wavelets, and the deep of depth of the ocean shall reduce. And I'm confident about it. It's basically about affirming a path to fulfill constitutional promises which must effectively reach at the ground level and to the level of the common man in the remote, remote past of a country, sharing the pain of another a justice with equity. And that is why I always believe, are you able to empathize with the man with a cause, empathize with the man with a grievance? In my whole career as a judge, I never dissociated myself with the lady of equity. I consider she has almost the equal status with the lady of justice, who is the queen of all virtues. With her permission, I want to add something before I conclude. Supposing somebody will ask me, Justice Mishra, write a write an autobiography. Many people are tempting me to write an autobiography. I told someone, I have a title. Would you publish with this title? The name of the book title would be, if I write, No Antonian. No Antonian. What I meant to say, no rhetorics. I do not call the Romans, the friends and the countrymen to lend their ears. No rhetorics, but hard work and respect for work with humility, treating the younger generation as friends and the elder generation as guides. I do not know if the title would be accepted or not or as two people once quarreled over a proposition. It's a beautiful one. Troubled, troubled with a title. Troubled with a title. The posterity shall judge whose title shall fit in if, it's a big if, if I decide to write. Huh? I have other things to write. In the last I must frankly confess. If I am confessing, why do I say frankly? You must have some kind of curiosity in your mind. If a man like me cannot raise your curiosity, I think it's all focus, focus. That's why I say, I frankly confess that I am, and I mean it. All of you must appreciate that I mean it. I must frankly convince, confess that I am indebted to the bar for their assistance at every level and I go from here wholly satisfied. The contentment in me knows no bounds and it has 
to speak in a different language has no boundary it may look like a paradox but it is the truth containment may not have any boundary but here stands the man who tells you and frankly confessing i am contented i am satisfied and i respect the bar from the core of my heart and i part by not saying i do but by saying we shall meet or we will meet thank you thank you very much